populism is on the rise. In the past decades, we have seen a steady increase of support for extreme or not so extreme right-wing populist parties, such as AfD in Germany, which is rather recent, but we have other players who are around for much longer time, such as Front National in France. And um, in Hungary, we have uh, Viktor Orban. And in Poland, we have the PiS party and Kaczynski. And in the Netherlands, we have um, Geert Wilders with the PVV. And in Austria, we have the FPÖ. And as probably all of you know, in 2016, Western liberal society got a double whammy of first Brexit and then Trump. And I felt a bit like uh, this lady here. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a long four years. And maybe even a long eight years, you never know. Now seven or three. And the question was, how come this can be so successful? And I think uh, what I realized over the past one and a half years is uh, there are two main reasons. And the first one is there are real problems. So there are real problems that um, our governance model based on nation states, largely on nation states, has increasingly been unable to solve, such as the rise in immigration or terrorism or um, the rise in inequality uh, or massive tax evasion and so on and so on. And um, what has happened is that while the economy has been globalized, our governance models have not. So they are state national, and so they are increasingly incapable of addressing those globalized uh, problems. And that leads to frustration and anger, and then uh, people fall for demagogues who promise uh, something better. But the second reason is communication. And many uh, successful populists are great communicators. And it's a bit like this. Uh, we feel like they tell it like it is. And so I, was, I work as a communications consultant right now, and so this really bothered me. I was like, ah, how can this be? Donald Trump is like insulting everyone, from his opponents to the media, to the courts, to uh, women, to minorities. And he, according to a test by the uh, Boston Globe, has only fourth grade English in his speeches. Um, and of course, he was lying constantly, or let's say had a free relationship with the truth. And, <laughs> So I was like, oh, what does it mean? Like, is he a good speaker? I'd always like, used uh, Obama as a great example of public speaking and rhetoric. And here we have Trump, and obviously he's also very effective as a speaker. And so I wanted to understand, so what is this all about? And so I uh, took a deep dive into populism, its roots, and its narrative, and the communication approach of its figureheads, and also tried eventually to come up with some solutions to it, so some effective countermeasures. And this is what I would like to share with you today, what I've um, researched and done in the past one and a half years. One heads up, when I say talk like Trump, I don't mean talk like this. <laughs> so use the same words or be aggressive or insult everyone or, or so on and lie. Um, what I mean more is understand what makes Trump and other populists an effective speaker and then use those weapons against them. And it also means to understand that, like Obama, Trump is a great storyteller. And he appeals very effectively to emotions. Very different emotions from Obama, but still emotions. In order to uh, deal with populism at the level of communication, we first need to understand its narrative. And there are three key aspects, so three differences of how populists talk and how, well, who is a person who is actually not a populist? Well, I would say liberals, classic liberalism, um, or globalists, or the best way I've come to describe it is friends of the open society talk. So those three differences are populists look very differently at the future. They look very differently at second um, at how the world works. And they look very differently at third, how society works, compared to the friends of the open society. So let's start. Um, liberals, or globalists. The classic liberal narrative is one that goes like this. The future will always be better than the past and the present. And it's a uh, narrative that people have believed for a very long time. You and your kids will be better off in the future. And we can all work together to make this happen. So this is kind of the basic vision and the basic promise. Now, if you look at uh, Trump's campaign slogan, make America great again, you already see the difference. And if you look at, for example, uh, Marine Le Pen's um, statement here, the quote, only the Front National plans to give back to France those essential weapons, such as control of its national budget and borders, and so on and so on. And you see 
this basically is the attempt to take us back to the past. The vision of the future of the populist is the return to an idealized past. It's a, you could say, a nostalgic vision. You people have lost something of value, and I'm going to give it back to you. And this has been surprisingly successful in the past uh, years and decades, but maybe not so surprisingly because people feel sometimes the future has become like a black wall. It's like we don't know where we are going. There's a high degree of uncertainty. And so um, what do you do when you're uncertain? Well, you go back to uh, a time or place when you still knew your way around. The second difference um, between populists and liberals lies in how they see the world. So the classic uh, liberal idea is that we should try to get away from short-term thinking, from intuition, from gut feeling and so on, to something larger, like universal values, universal principles maybe, universal human rights, to scientific reasoning, knowledge with ever greater reach. And liberals also believe in abstract principles like institutions and checks and balances and so on. Now, while this movement of the liberals is a opening up to the world, the movement of the populists is exactly the opposite. It's closing down to the world. And they don't believe in universal things in general or scientific evidence or reasoning and so on. They say, we trust only common sense, our gut feeling. And um, what's important is the good national attitude. And if you're against the common sense or the good national attitude, well, by definition, you're an enemy of the people. So we we abandon those ideals of liberalism and we go back to something like truthiness. When something feels right, it must be right. Or we go to simply group loyalty. So it doesn't matter what it's true or not, but what my tribe thinks, and I believe the same thing. The third difference, and maybe the most important one between the populists and the liberals, is how they see society. The liberal narrative is inclusive. Everyone can join into the story, into the vision, and be, become a part of it. And the us that the liberals define is one that can grow over time. So Obama, for example, said, like, all of us play allegiance to the stars and stripes. All of us are Americans. And he try, tried to go away from blue states and red states and uh, Democrats and Republicans and so on. But of course, that's just the first step. I guess many of you would say, I'm not just a national of Germany or of Mexico or whatever, but I'm also a European in this case, or maybe I'm a citizen of the world in the end. So the idea of liberalism is to enlarge this um, identity, this us, this we. When I looked then at the statements of the populists, what you see is something like this. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and so on. You might have heard this statement. Or in Germany, we have the AFD, uh, and someone from their party said, when we arrive, we will clean up, then we clean out, then politics will be made for the people again, and only for the people, because we are the people, dear friends. So here we see the classic movement of their strong enemies, right? Strong enemy pictures. You have those people up there, the liberal elite, the corrupt establishment that has sold out the people. And that's left-wing and right-wing populism. In right-wing populism, we have this movement uh, to condemn the others. It's against the others, such as immigrants or minorities or uh, social welfare recipients, whatever. So it's always against up there and against out there. And the us, it's very exclusive. It's usually ethnically or culturally homogenous. And only the populace determines if, this is, uh, if you're part of the people, the real people, the hardworking Americans or not. And so then you come to a point where Erdogan, for example, says, like, we are the people. Who are you? You don't matter. So, and there is the true danger of populism. It's delegitimizing delegit everyone who is not of the same opinion and who is not part of how they define the people. So it's anti-pluralistic and anti-democratic at its core. It lives from, gains its energy from exclusion and division. That's kind of the third element of the three. In total, we populists want to take us back to the past. They want to take us back to the tribal, close off, and they want to divide us and exclude people to gain power from this and influence. Now, what can we do about it? How can we fight the populace effectively? And when I say we, I say you uh, and me. Um, and I don't think, I, I don't know, I, I suspect that Wonder Woman is not in the audience today. If Wonder Woman is here, please raise her hand. Oh, we have one Wonder Woman, so I can go. I, thank you. No. <laughs> So for the cases that Wonder Woman is not around, and that might be in most places, in most times, I would like to propose the following. It's the 
Trumple the Trump approach. That's how you could call it. So it's based on my research and talking to experts um, and thinking hard about the problem for the past one and a half years and also observing really what has worked and what hasn't worked. And it has three elements. The first one, tell stories that are properly framed and worded. People think in stories. We think about abstract things such as the government or political leaders in terms of things we know, something like how are things in families, our own families. And Trump really played to one of the two dominant models, the strict father model. So it's all about top-down communication, it's about control. And the assumption is people are bad and you need punishments also to uh, motivate them and to make them better. The other um, main frame is the nurture and parent model. And you might also know this, it's kind of, we meet at eye level, we're empathetic, fairness is very important, and we generally believe people are good, and you need to encourage and motivate them and make them even better people. So there are two um, contrasting uh, family models. And now, if you are faced with someone activating one of the frames, such as we need to build a wall, we need to ban Muslims from coming to the United States, it's very bad to just negate the frame and to say like, no, we shouldn't do this, because by negating the frame, you strengthen the frame. What you should do instead is activate your frame with your own story. Now, that's one example of doing this is tell a, um, a family story. Here, the story of the black sheep or uh, the brown sheep. Imagine you have five children, five sons, and one of them does something bad. Now, would you punish all of them? No, that would be observed. I mean, very unfair. Um, you punish only the person that did something bad. And the same thing is with people coming from other countries and maybe who might be committing crimes. It would be very unfair and un-American to punish all of them based on their nationality or based on their religion. Um, and that you wouldn't want that to be done to you either. So this is an example of how you can try to act, tell a story that activates a different frame. So you're not just working yourself off uh, the proposition that might be very outrageous or controversial of the populist. Then, of course, when you tell stories, you need to um, mind your word choice. So uh, some of you might know, in the discussion, we, um, and the AfD and Alice Weidel pictured here also did this, but we often called about streams of refugees, streams of people coming to a country. What that does is basically you frame people as a natural disaster. And what do you do when you're facing the tsunami, the flood, and so on? Well, you build dams. The solution naturally flows from the frame that is being activated. So be very careful, never use those kind of um, words. What if, instead of talking about refugees, we talked about people seeking protection, or even newcomers. That even sounds nice, right? A new music band and newcomers in our country. What if we talked not about a refugee crisis, but a solidarity crisis? And if we go away from this topic, if you're confronted with the accusation, you are fake news and you're a journalist, you shouldn't say, like, I'm not fake news. You should say, OK, let's have a discussion about truth and journalism. So uh, you activate a different frame, and uh, from there on, you have better chances. So if you talk about uh, climate change, well, change might be good even, right? I mean, a bit of change, well, here once, and here and there, and a bit warmer might be nicer in, in a country like Germany. So you should instead talk clearly about the climate catastrophe that is very different, a very different image and a very different effect that the, those words have. Or finally, don't talk about the people. Better about some people, some citizens, or many citizens and so on. So differentiate here. The second thing that I think works is to expose the flawed logic of populism if you're in a, a debate or in a talk show, reveal openly how the populist logic works. So that they want to take us back to a past that never existed and that will probably never exist. That they want to divide us and that the real enemy is not the Chinese or the Mexicans who are taking away our jobs, but actually division itself. Someone did this remarkably well and uh, was, for example, Emmanuel Macron, now president of France, who in the debate with Marine Le Pen said, the high priestess of fear is sitting in front of me. Madame Le Pen's idea is that we're going to leave Europe because the others can make it, but we can't. In the face of this spirit of defeat, I am for the spirit of conquest, because France has always succeeded. So there you see how he calls out the logic that the populists live from fear and anger and moves over to his own project, his own ideas. And that's the third element that's very important. You have to have your own project, your own vision. And uh, in Germany, that has been a big black hole in, in the past years in terms of vision. <laughs> but that's what we need. And it has to have certain elements. So it needs to be inclusive in the best tradition of liberalism. It needs to address the feelings of impotence and the feeling of loss of agency and the insecurity that many people are feeling. 
And then it needs to define new ways of participation in society. So how can you um, participate um, productively, economically, um, politically, socially? And finally, also important, you have to sketch out a positive role for technology. Because um, technology is often like pictured in the, in the public discourse as a force of disruption that will take away our jobs and that will cause just problems. And um, it, I think it's very important to make a strong case for how, um, which positive effects technology can have on all our lives, if it's managed well, implemented well, and if, it's, uh, if the benefits, of course, are spread uh, across the board equally in society. So this is the Trump of the Trump approach. I hope I made a good case, and I personally am convinced that only if the friends of the open society start to tell powerful, strong stories again with the good word choice and the good frames, when they expose the logic of populism and how they live from fear and frustration and anger, and if they are bold and courageous in their visions again, can we hope to deal effectively with populism? Karl Popper, one of the main philosophers of the 20th century, maybe the greatest, uh, he said, the fight against tyranny, against authoritarianism, and for democracy, for open and liberal societies, is never over. It needs to be fought again and again. And so it depends, I think, on all of us um, to protect our democratic values, protect the achievements of civilization, and it depends on all of our commitment and our joint action. And ultimately, of course, it depends on your communication, the way you talk. So, yes, talk like Trump in terms of becoming an expert storyteller. But then, Trump the Trump. And with it, all of populism. Thank you very much. Thank you.